Apparently, you need to turn on the mic. <laughs> there you go. All right. The world didn't hear me pray. They know I prayed, though. All right, so I will go on. Um, so at some point, I'll make up that lecture. I'm not sure how, but it'll happen. So I'm going to continue on. So I want to prove some things using the index notation because I want to give you more examples of how we prove things with index notation. And I think a good one to do would be the associativity of matrix multiplication. So I want to prove that AX Z is equal to AX Z, but I'm going to put some parentheses in here. Um, so this is theorem 2.3.11 on page 24. It's part one. Uh, one of the properties of matrix multiplication is that it's associative. So, um, which is, you know, really pretty neat. Now here, um, I'm assuming that A, X, and Z are all matrices of appropriate size. So let's say that um, A is in our um, M, by, um, M by P, X is in our uh, P by Q, let's say, and Z is in our Q by, I don't know, L. All right. So I need those dimensions for the matrices in order to multiply them. Right. Uh, you know, what's a word for when two matrices are multipliable? I guess you could call them multipliable matrices. Some books use the word conformable. There doesn't seem to be a good agreement on what to say about two matrices when they can be multiplied, but we do need to understand when they can be multiplied. In order to multiply them, you know, you need to have this and that, if you can look at where I am, match up. So you need to have the number of columns in the left factor match the number of rows in the right factor. All right? So we'd like to prove the identity above, right? So how do we prove this? Now, again, throughout this lecture, I'm assuming R is a what? Commutative ring, right? And with, you know, identity, which we'll denote by one. Which is, again, just a shorthand for saying it could be reals, it could be complexes, it could be rationals, it could be Z mod N. It could be a bunch of things. But they all share addition, multiplication, in the, in the way we discussed last class. Okay, so I want to prove that that's equal to that. So here's the technique we use for this kind of thing. We use an index calculation. So what I need to do is put some parentheses in. See, if I just put IJ right now, it would be ambiguous what I meant by that. See, because you might think that I'm talking about the ijth component of z multiplying this matrix ax, right? So to be clear about what I mean there, I put some more parentheses in to emphasize I'm thinking about the ijth component of the matrix ax times z. Then I use the definition of matrix multiplication, which I shared with you last time. In this case, it's the sum, let's say uh, k, equals 1 to what? Well, let's see here. AX is a what? It's a actually going to be an M by Q matrix. So this is going to be a sum K equals 1 to Q of AX parentheses I K times Z K J. So and then when we're doing this kind of proof, what we do is we put like a little colon or something, and then we say by definition of matrix multiplication. I'm okay if you abbreviate, as long as there's enough there for me to see what you're doing, all right? Like you could say matrix mult. That'd be fine. Next step, we go, okay, well, this is the sum, k equals 1 to q, that's still there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the ax term, right? ax can also be written as the sum of, I need some other letter, I've, um, I don't know, um, r. r 
equals 1 to, really, I just need to use a letter I haven't already used, right? That's the, the one kind of limitation. Um, I might use L if I hadn't already used it up there, all right, for example. So R equals 1 to what? AX. It's a m by p times a p by q, so we're, we're, we're going to have a sum over p here. r equals 1 to p, and this is going to be a i r x r k. And then I've still got the z k j here. Again, this is by definition of matrix multiplication for a x, all right? And it should go without saying that you're welcome to like take pictures of the board in here if that helps you. Like that is totally cool with me. Um, and you can record me if you like. I mean, there's always that. <laughs> uh, just don't record before I record. Um, <clears throat> those things better left off recording. So then at this point, we have to refer to properties of finite sums, all right? And so you can prove that by properties of finite sums, we can rewrite this as the sum k equals 1 to q sum r equals 1 to p of a i r x r k times z k j. So this is just property of summation. If you wanted to prove that, it would be some kind of inductive induction proof. All right. I'm going to focus on the task at hand, though, and not do that. That's a property of finite sums we can refer to. Now, what can I do with what I'm looking at? I'm about to underline it in pink. What is a commutative ring? It is a commutative ring. In particular, it has a multiplication which is associative, right? So at this point, I'm going to use the associative property of multiplication on the ring. Sum k equals 1 to q. Sum r equals 1 to p of a i r parentheses x r k z k j close parentheses. And this is by associativity of multiplication in the ring R. Or you could say that because ring multiplication is associative, all right, by assumption. Then what do we do? Let me just kind of backtrack what we've already done, all right? First of all, we need to use a property of finite sums again to pull. So here, you know, just to give you a kind of intuitive guide, if you will, for why this makes sense, maybe this will be convincing to you. Is there any, um, is there any k dependence? Does this have any k dependence? No. So, that means I can pull this sum over k. I can pull the sum into there. Again, this is a property of finite sums. So let me do that over here. So continuing, we have equals, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the start. A x times z, parentheses i j, we have that that's equal to making the pink step I indicated at the end. The sum r equals 1 to p a i r sum k equals 1 to q of x r k z K, J, 
right? I'll put some parentheses in here for emphasis. And that is, again, by property of um, finite summation. Now the question is, what are we looking at? Well, so the way this is, is, is kind of like taking one of those telescopes or mon was it monocle, I don't know, you kind of telescope it out and then you just kind of go back in. So we're going to kind of reverse the steps. So next up would be to use the definition of matrix multiplication on XZ here. See this? This is precisely XZ R J by definition of matrix multiplication for XZ, right? And so this is equal to the sum R equals 1 to P of AIR parentheses XZ RJ. And then what's, what's the next step? Yeah, definition, exactly. By the definition again, we have that this is A times XZ parentheses IJ by definition of matrix multiplication of A with XZ. So what have we shown? We have shown, well, almost. We have shown that the, I mean, pretty much. We have shown that the IJth component of AX times Z is equal to the IJth component of A times XZ, right? Since the above holds, the calculation above holds for all ij, it follows that axz is equal to axz with parentheses appropriately placed. So there you go. That is a nearly complete proof that matrix multiplication is associative. Yep. And when you say nearly complete, you mean the only, the only thing we're really missing is the proof of the property of sums, right? That is true. The, okay. the gap here is that I have not proved those properties of, of sums. I don't think it adds much to the course for me to prove those either, so I, I just don't. I, I have had, there may be still something in Chapter 1 where I have actually proved some of those things, but um, anyway. So this is a pretty pretty typical point. Now the one in your the one in your homework is a little bit easier. I just asked you to prove that a times a plus b is equal to b plus a. That's considerably shorter. You don't have to fight with matrix multiplication, right? Here, let's let's look at another. This this is kind of like yay. So matrix is matrix multiplication is associative, like big deal, right? Well, let me show you an identity which is a little bit less less obvious. Let's let A be in R M by P and B be in R P by N. And let's see, consider A B parentheses transpose, A B parentheses transpose I J. So my, my theme for today is going to be trying to show you how to write down and prove things using index notation for matrices, all right? It's really a kind of separate skill, skill set from manipulating small matrices with numbers in them and actually doing calculations, right? I mean, two sides, I mean, we're talking about the same math, right? For specific examples versus how do you prove general things, right? Proving general things is part of this course, so I need to spend some energy there. And that's what we're doing. So here, transpose, what's the definition of transpose? We do what? We flip the row and the column index. So 
step one is that this is AB ji. That's the definition of transpose. All right. Next up, this is equal to the sum k equals 1 to p of a j k b k i. That's the definition of matrix multiplication. Now, here, what, what do we know about AJK and BKI? These are just what? These are just numbers in the commutative ring R, right? So we're assuming that it's a commutative ring. So we can change the order of BKI and AJK because these are just numbers in R, all right? So this is equal to the sum. K equals 1 to P of BKI. A, J, K, since A, J, K, and B, K, I are just elements of R which commute, right? Multiplication in the ring commutes, so I can switch the order of these. And then what do I do? You're like, I don't know, you didn't tell me what we're doing. Well, let me... We're, we're going to discover something together, right? What if I, if I want to make this look like a matrix multiplication again, I need to have what? I need to have something like, I need to have the K to match up with, so in order to put the K in the, put the K on the right of the, of the left term, and to put it on the left of the right term, I should look at the transpose of B and the transpose of A. Like this is equal to, sum k equals 1 to p of b transpose i k and a transpose k j, right? Definition of transpose, two times. Yeah? Yes, sir? What exactly are we trying to prove now? I don't know yet. <laughs> it just is considered That's right. that matrix transpose. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. I told my Calc 2 class this morning that sometimes my teaching is like building Legos. Sometimes you're building a Lego set, right? And you're about midway through, and you look down and you go, what is this, right? Especially with the unnecessary technic in interior of Star Wars ships these days. Um, more of a Pokemon? Uh, I, I, uh, I do not know how to explain my, my teaching in terms of the Pokemon universe. I mean, I, I know a number of Pokemons. I know you, you got your, uh, your Charizard and you, your, 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 your Equaza is always big. Or Equaza. And uh, there's something like 750 Pokemon. But, what um, after like 150 or whatever? Well, you got to think about the different stages, right? You got like three different stages. And, yeah. I don't know. But, I feel like this is not going to help you guys in the big scheme of things, but um, okay. So the answer to your what I was trying to get at is when when you're done building the Lego set, it makes sense. So like, give me like thirty seconds, it'll make sense. And so definition of matrix multiplication again gives us this, but since the calculation holds for all i and j, we find the beloved socks, shoes identity A, B transpose is equal to B transpose A transpose. So this index business, it's not just good for proving things that are kind of like snooze fests, like associativity. It also proves rather exciting and perhaps unanticipated matrix identities. Yeah. 
the power of what we're doing is you realize that we've just proved the sock shoes identity for matrices of arbitrary size. If you write matrices as boxes of numbers and try to do this kind of proof, it is so much worse. All right? How do I know this? I have students. I've seen them try to do it in their homework. Trust me, it's bad. Yes? Oh, because I have to first take off my shoes and then take off my socks, but then when I put them back on, usually you have to put the socks on first, you know? So I won't take off my socks. No one should have to see that. But, <laughs> but. Or I guess with Sprano, it would just be a shoes, 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 shoes identity, but no. <laughs> Toe shoes. I love his toe shoes. They're awesome. So anyway, this is, of course, a interesting and useful identity. All right. So enough of that. Let me um, move along here. So there is a um, <clears throat> wide variety of identities which are known for matrices. Essentially, they behave the same as a ring. I mean, there's a distributive property for multiplication against addition. Um, but the one, one of the things, one of the major things that doesn't happen for matrices is they do not, they do not commute. Like A times B is not equal to B times A, right? Let me um, show you an example of that and just a little bit more notational. So, you know, this we can say, A, I, J, B, K, L is equal to A, excuse me, B, K, L times A, I, J. This we could say where A and B are, let's say, let's make them square just to make things simple, n by n matrices. Like this I could say, why can I say that? Because that is just a statement about the ij and the kl components of A and B respective. Those are numbers in the ring, they commute. However, this I could not say. If I had these parentheses like this, um, this is the typical, this is no longer, no longer true. See, because another notation that I hadn't told you yet is that we also like to use this. So this is the matrix. The matrix is the collection of these components, A, I, J. So with a square bracket like this, we indicate a matrix. Without the square bracket, it's just the component of the matrix, which is a number. Numbers commute matrices? Not necessarily. All right. Let me show you an example of that. If we take A equals to 1, 0, 2, 0. And if we take B equal to 1, 3, 0, 0, I'm hoping that'll do it for us. What's A times B equal to? Let's see here. I get 1 plus 6, I get a 7. I get 0. And I get zeros over here. If I calculate BA, I calculate 1. By the way, at that point, we're already done. If even one entry in the two matrices disagrees, they're not equal. So in, in principle, I could stop right there and say, oh, game over. They're not equal. But I'll continue. 3, 2, 6. As you can see, A, B is not equal to B, A. Matrices do not commute, usually. All right? So let's talk about some special, special kinds of matrices. One very special matrix is the zero matrix. What do you think the zero matrix would be? like a plus zero should be equal to a again. So we define zero, zero ij to be what? 
Yeah, it's, it's zero. Zero is a very degenerate object. We use zero to mean so many different things. The zero function, the zero number, the zero complex number. The, I mean, zero is so many things. But anyway, that's the zero matrix. There's also a matrix that works like this. AI is equal to um, AI, like that, for all A. Well, well, I should be careful here. Well, I could say this. A, A, M, I, let's say, let's say A is, is um, R, M by N. I've got to make the matrix multiplication. So the, the M by N identity times A would be A. A times the N by N, N as in Nenu Nenu, identity times A would be equal to A. Here, I M is 1, 1, da, 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 1, zeros elsewhere. It's the so-called M by N identity matrix. Um, let me, let me just show you how that works for a small matrix, yeah? Suppose I have the matrix A, B, C, D, E, F, like this, All right? I could multiply this, this is a what? This is a 3 by 2 matrix, right? So I could multiply that on the on the right, yeah, I can multiply that on the right by a 2 by 2 matrix, right? What's the 2 by 2 identity look like? It's just 1, 0, 0, 1. All right? So what I get from this is a, b, uh, oh, a, <clears throat> so I do a, a times 1 plus B times 0, I get 0 times A plus 1 times B. This gives me C times 1 plus D times 0. I get 0 times C plus 1 times, times D. I get E times 1 plus F times 0. And here I get 0 times E plus 1 times F. And if you look at that, the zeros go away, and the ones stay, and what do you got? Right. You got the matrix you started with again. Yeah. Yeah, the identity matrix is a square matrix. So here's a, here's a general definition. IN is in RN by N. Like you said, it's square is given by i n i j equals to what is called the Kronecker delta i j. Like, yeah, you're defining something I am just learning by something I don't know. Good job. Yes? So how would you get an m by n? Hmm? How do you get an m by n? Oh, still the marker. Okay. There you go. Thank you, sir. Very good. So, no, it has to be square, and um, so this is, is 0, is 1 if i is equal to j, and it's 0 if i is not equal to j. All right? Now, there's a couple of, maybe th there's really three very special cases of matrix multiplication, which I have not clarified yet. I, I told you that that was the general definition of matrix multiplication at the end of last class, right? And that's true with some understanding. Um, there are particular cases which require um, a more sort of nuanced understanding of what the definition means, all right? What do I mean by that? So like if we're looking at R M by N times a R 
n by 1 matrix, right, that kind of product, then what, what, what's, the, what's the answer? This, is, this gives a, right, it gives an m, an m by 1 matrix, which is a what? Yeah, that, that is a, it is m rows in one column, right? That's a column vector. By the way, our definition, this is, I mean, you're like, when are you going to stop making definitions? <laughs> the answer is never. I don't think there will be a, there, there, I would be surprised if there's ever a lecture in this course where a new definition doesn't somehow work its way in. Maybe it'll happen eventually, but it's going to be a while. There is going to be a continual, continual flow of definitions which you need to try to assimilate into your, your being, all right? Knowing these is knowing the course. But anyway, so this is our, our, our default notation for our m by 1. This is column vectors. And um, so if I, here's the definition anyway, if I have a times x, all right? And I want to talk about what is ax. So here a is an m by n. All right, x is an n by 1, right? So what am I talking about right now? This is a matrix, m by n, and this is a column vector. Itself is n by 1, yeah? And the output is supposed to be an m, as in, as in mummy component. So how many, how many indices should I have here? I, I don't have two indices. Right? There's just one. There's just a row index here because we're ranging over the m rows in this one column vector. So the definition of matrix multiplication in this case just looks like this. Let's see here if I can get it right. Uh, a, I, K, X, K. K equals 1, 2, do, 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 N. So it's kind of a special case, all right? Actually, mo many of the multiplications we'll do in this course have this form. It's a matrix column multiplication. Matrix times a column gives us a column again, all right? <clears throat> you could also talk about a row vector times a matrix, right? If we did, say, um, y times a, where y was a um, one row by um, m columns, and a was again m by n, then ya, the jth component of that, would be the sum, let's say, um, I don't know, k equals 1 to m of y, uh, do, 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 y, k, a, k, j. These are kind of special cases of the definition of matrix multiplication. I don't want them to, what's the other kind of weird case that could happen? Weird in the sense that an arbitrary matrix product has two indices, right? If it's a, you know, it's a genuine matrix, then the the output has an i and a j, right? Like we, we have with the two calculations they did at the start of today. What, what's the other way? What, 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 when do we not even need an index at all? What if you have like a, a one by one matrix, right? That's the other thing that's kind of an oddball. If you have um, a in r one by n and b in R n by 1, then a b is just equal to the sum k equals 1 to n of a, what do we got here? 1 k b um, k 1. And in fact, usually we don't even, I mean, do you write this? No. When we have a matrix that just has one row or one column, we don't, we don't even have, we don't even write this one here like this, right? Because it's just a row vector or a column vector. What I'm really saying here is that if you have, 
something like, you know, let's say a1, a2, da da dot, da, da, an, and you're multiplying it by a b1, b2, bn, guess what you get? You get a number, and that number is the dot product of these two vectors. It's just a1, b1, a2, b2, an, bn, right? Okay, I said there's three weird cases. That's not entirely true. There's at least one other that's kind of, that'll catch you off guard if you're not watching out for it. As we think about mat multiplying matrices, what if the, you know, what if you have something that's like R M by one times R one by, by N? Would that make sense? I mean, the one matches up in the middle, right? Usually that, that motivates a sum over K, but this time there'd be no sum, right? So what is that? Yeah, an R, R M by N matrix, right? So what's, what's the rule if we have something like, you know, let me use V um, and, 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 and W, and we're saying the ijth component of that, what is it equal to? It's just <laughs> the ith component of, of V times the jth component of W. It's kind of a stupid... This will catch you guys off guard if you're not watching out for it. Let me show you a numerical example of that one. <clears throat> if I have one, two, three, um, let's see here, this is, a th uh, what is this? this is a one by three, right? And then I have something like a, a six and seven, like this, this is a what? Two by one the resulting matrix is a two by three, and what does it look like? That is, that is how we multiply a column times a row. <coughs> All right. Well, this is good. I usually forget to say these things until much later, and it catches up with us at some later lecture. I'm like, oh, man, I forgot to define such and so forth, but I think we got everything in, in line here. So now I'm going to turn the page here a little bit. Um, and by the way, we will eventually motivate why the definition for matrix multiplication is given as it is. There are very good and deep reasons for that that we will be discovering as we go on. Um, so at the moment, I want to kind of change gears a little bit and talk about how we can use a special kind of matrix to build other matrices, all right? So in particular, I want to talk about the so-called standard basis. So here we have E, e lower i. The jth component of that is given to be delta ij. Um, where e, EI is an element of Rn, right? In other words, EI is a column vector. Just to, you know, make it simple here for a second, if we're talking about R2, we have E1 is 1, 0. We have E2 is 0, 1. All right. If we're talking about R3, we have E1 is 1, 0, 0. We have that E2 is 0, 1, 0. And we have that E3 is 0, 0, 1. These are the so-called standard basis vectors. In fact, we can build any vector in Rn as a linear combination of these vectors. Hey, there's a new term. What's a linear combination? What does that mean? So I, I actually have a precise definition written down in the notes. I'd like you to read that, but I'll just say it in words here. A linear combination of objects is when we take those objects and we add them together 
and also each one of them that's being added we could possibly multiply by a number in the ring, right? So it's like, you could say it's a weighted average in some sense, right? It's a lot like that. Um, just, oh, here. So just to make good on what I just said, if I had V equals to A comma B in R2, right? I could rewrite this as A comma zero plus zero comma B, right? And by definition of scalar multiplication, I can pull A out like that. <coughs> and I can pull B out like this, right? And so, uh, this is A times E1 plus B times E2. In other words, V is equal to um, the sum i equals 1 to 2 of vi ei if we set what? v1 equals to what and v2 equals to what? Yeah, v, uh, v1 be a, let v2 be b. So we can build any vector by the standard basis. How about row vectors? How could we build any row vector? If W is an element of R1 by N, right, then you can easily show W is equal to the sum uh, I equals 1 to N of WI EI what? I need a row vector. How do I get a row vector from a column vector? Yeah, I just transpose it. So the transpose of the standard basis gives us a way to build any row vector. And uniquely so. There's only one way to build a given vector from these. We'll prove that eventually. What happens if we multiply these things? What if we look at EI and EJ both in RN, then how could I multiply those? <coughs> There's really only, well, I mean, does it make sense to multiply them? I guess not, right? What could we, how could we multiply them though? What would uh, EI transpose would be where? one by n, right? So if we had EI transpose in one by n, EJ is in n by one, then we can multiply those, right? So like what's e, EI transpose times EJ equal to? Is there, well, first of all, is there any index on this? Notice that i and j are not indices. They're not components of a vector in this calculation. These are labels for like the ith one and the jth one. It's a very different use of i and j than we were at the start of class. Like this is not an enumeration. This is not a component of a specific matrix. This is a list of vectors. It's an enumeration of different objects, not a label in a given object. Um, so anyway, this would be sum k equals 1 to n of ei transpose, the kth component of that, times ej, the kth component of that, right? But what was the definition? I mean, this is nothing more than sum k equals 1 to n, Kronecker delta ik, and this is Kronecker delta jk. What, is, what does Kronecker delta do? It says that it's only non-zero if what? If, if, the, if, the, yeah, if the indices match. So the only way that this can give us something non-zero is when i is equal to k and when j is equal to k, right? Here i and j are free. They're fixed but arbitrary given to us from the start of the problem. 
It's the k that goes away. k is the dummy index of summation. In short, we just get one thing here. We get one. Uh, if what? Yeah, if i equals to k equals to j, and we get zero if i is not equal to j, right? In other words, we get the Kronecker delta again. So ei transpose times ej is equal to Kronecker delta ij. This is just a new language for saying the dot product of two standard basis vectors is zero unless they're the same vector. This you already know from calculus three if you had it, right? Like i dot i is one, i dot j is zero, i dot k is zero, k dot k is one, k dot j is zero, k dot i is zero, right? I'm using E1 and E2 and E3 rather than IJK, which you might be familiar with, but this, this story remains, the song remains the same. Standard basis vectors, in fact, are orthogonal. That will only be made precise in here much later. But what would happen then if, on the other hand, I take EI in, let's say, R, um, RM, and I say, which is again, R what? M by one, right? And I take EJ in RN, which is again, RN by one. And suppose I wanna build something that's M by N. build an M by N matrix using these. And let me put a bar over the J one so that we're not confused. These are different, these are different sizes, right? Like, I'm just, you can adorn one to distinguish them if you're using different dimensions, right? Like M could be three, N could be seven. So let's just try to distinguish them for the discussion at the moment, all right? So how would I build an M by N matrix from these? It seems like what I would want to do is do EI, right? times EJ what? EJ transpose, right? See, that would be a M by one times a one by N. This is an M by N matrix. What matrix is that? This, in fact, has a name. This is, by definition, big E, IJ, the so-called matrix unit. And here's a standalone definition for it, E, I, J, K, L is equal to Kronecker delta, I, K, Kronecker delta, J, L. What this is, is a matrix which has one in only one spot and zero everywhere else. Where does this matrix have a one in? Yeah, the ijth component. Let's see here. Let's try it out. So let's do um, one zero times the matrix, you know, zero, one, zero. I'll do uh, in terms of my notation over there. And I forgot my bar, guys, right? There's supposed to be a bar on this, wasn't there? Yeah? So I'm, I'm you know, ex making an explicit example there. We're doing E1 times E bar, what? Two. This is allegedly going to be a two by three matrix, which has a one in the where? In the two, three spot. Or did I do that wrong? The one, two spot, I can't. <laughs> Read my own example. Duh. Okay, so how do we do it? Zero, zero, one, zero, and then zeros again. Using that matrix multiplication I shared with you up there. And that is exactly, quote unquote, e t uh, E12. You're like, oh, okay, why? Why do you want that, right? Good question, like why, why do we care about the EIJs? My parting thought for you today 
is that if we take any matrix A, we can build it as a sum I equals 1 to M sum J equals 1 to N of A, I, J, E, I, J. So we can build any matrix as a sum of scalars times these special matrices which have zero in everything except for one spot. So in the same way we build vectors from the standard basis, we build matrices from the standard unit, the standard matrix basis. So next, next class or video, whichever one comes first, um, I will show you how these two things interact and there's like a lot of fun little identities and calculations that we can learn. This is, we're still in chapter two. I have some more to tell you about like symmetric versus anti-symmetric matrices, diagonal matrices, something called block multiplication. There's just some still matrix manipulation slash algebra we need to learn. Once that is done, then we turn our attention to systems of equations and we'll see how matrices help us solve equations, row reduction, all that stuff that you've heard about. So, thanks guys. Yep. Has the snow day changed?